defendant Karen Reed. This is in Massachusetts. This is the woman charged in the death of her boyfriend and Boston police officer John O'Keefe. This happened January 29th, 2022. Prosecutors allege that she hit him with her SUV after a little uh, night of carousing. However, the defense claims that this is really a large-scale police cover-up, a frame. So Karen Reed is charged with second-degree murder, motor vehicular manslaughter, and leaving the scene of a collision. If she's convicted, she's looking at up to life in prison. So now let's listen to uh, some more of the arguments that were made in one of the many pretrial hearings in this case. Uh, this is the defense attorney arguing for a third-party culprit evidence. Let's watch. Right, I understand that, Your Honor, and uh, that was my plan going into today anyway. Uh, so the, the initial question is, um, why is there a third-party culprit defense? Why is it relevant? Um, and we start, Your Honor, with the fact that our forensic medical examiner, Frank Sheridan, um, you know, a pathologist, forensic pathologist, who has uh, performed himself thousands and thousands of autopsies, has already submitted a sworn affidavit to this court that John O'Keefe's injuries are consistent with having been in a fight and are not consistent with having been hit by a car. Uh, since he submitted that affidavit, the federal authorities have provided us with their reports, whereby FBI experts also corroborate that John O'Keefe's injuries are not consistent with having been hit by a car. They employed experts in biomechanics and kinematics who have reviewed the evidence in this case, and they've confirmed that the physical evidence uh, conf uh, essentially shows and doesn't show what Dr. Sheridan has opined. So therefore, <clears throat> If John O'Keefe was not hit by a car, that means that Cameron Reed did not kill him. And we know that John O'Keefe did not die of natural causes. This was not a heart attack or a stroke. John O'Keefe was injured. He was mortally injured. If he was not hit by a car, as both our expert and FBI confirmed, then he was attacked. And if, if he was not hit by a car, then there is a third party culprit or culprits. So by asking this court to prohibit the defense from introducing evidence that others had the motive, opportunity, and the means to attack John O'Keefe, the Commonwealth is essentially asking this court to prohibit Karen Reed from being able to defend herself. So I, I don't think trial. they're asking that you be prohibited from doing that. They're asking first to have you tell them what that is. Right. Well, this is, you know, Your Honor, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that in terms of the, right, so go, the, go ahead. You the have, notice you have your that, that we're either required to give them or not. Um, you know, it is not our job to solve this case for the prosecution. It's our contention. They had the opportunity to do that, but they failed. It is not our job to name a specific third-party culprit. We do not have to prove that Brian Albert or Colin Albert or Brian Higgins or some combination of them intended to kill John O'Keefe. We don't have to prove that any of them attacked John O'Keefe such that he eventually died. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they didn't. But the fact of the matter is there is evidence that all three of them had a motive, had they, the opportunity and the means to attack John O'Keefe. Now, the, the Commonwealth cites Commonwealth versus Conkey in their motion, and as this court started the discussion on this issue when you first <laughs> took the bench, Conkey makes clear that a defendant has a constitutional right to argue that somebody else may have committed the crime. And certainly, no, the acts of that person can't be too attenuated in time or method of operation, as Mr. Lally uh, mentions. But in terms of being the right time period, Your Honor, you can't get any closer than their presence at the scene at the very time that John O'Keefe was killed. And in terms of the method of operation, given that we have evidence that he was not hit by a car and that he was attacked, the investigators in this case, Your Honor, including Michael Proctor, kept Colin Albert's name completely out of the police report. When this case began, I had no idea who Colin Albert was. Um, I received a tip right from the jump that Brian Albert and his nephew had beaten up John O'Keefe. I didn't even know Brian o Albert had a nephew at that time. 
But after receiving the tip, I learned of the conflict that Colin Albert had with John O'Keefe, so I sent a letter to Mr. Lally, I believe by certified mail. I knew that the DA's office was planning to present evidence or witnesses to a grand jury, and at that early juncture, before anybody uh, had, been, had asked them to indict, um, I notified the DA of three potential suspects, the ones that I'm talking about now, Brian Higgins, Brian Albert, and Colin Albert. Um, after he received that letter at our next court appearance, I'm sure Mr. Lally can confirm this, um, he acknowledged that both Brian Albert and Brian Higgins would be testifying or had testified before the grand jury, but he questioned why I included Colin Albert in my letter. He told me at the time that he had no evidence that Colin Albert was there that night. However, after receiving my letter, lo and behold, multiple witnesses testified that Colin Albert was at 34 Fairview <clears throat> the night of January 28th to 29th. And now the DA will argue, I'm sure, at trial that he left before Joan O'Keefe arrived. We don't find their evidence compelling. We don't accept it. We are not required to accept their theory of the case. We're entitled to present a defense. His presence at 34 Fairview gave him the opportunity, along with the motive, to harm John O'Keefe. With regard to Brian Albert, Your Honor, um, this is a well-connected, well-known, powerful family in the town of Canton, Massachusetts. Brian Albert was present at that home when Colin Albert was there. <coughs> Colin Albert is a member of the Albert family. He's nephew of Brian Albert. We have evidence that Brian Albert had expressed hostility toward John O'Keefe as well. And we know that he initiated a phone call with Brian Higgins at 2.22 in the morning. He reached out to Brian Higgins. All right, let's, uh, let's get into this. Joining me this hour, law and crime legal analyst Brian Buckmeyer and trial attorney Catherine Lazardo. Good to have you both along. Appreciate it. Uh, Brian, uh, you know, we're in the motion in limine part of this pretrial, but we're learning so much about look at Look at all these questions I have. I have all these questions already. We haven't even started the trial. And I, I, there will be a final later. Get your scantrons ready. But for now, Brian, uh, tell me why there seemed to be some prohibition attempt by the prosecution to, to, to limit third party culpability, liability, or that other guy did it defense. Yeah, so the easy answer is if you want a judge to ultimately speak to the jury at the end of the trial and give that instruction that you want, whether it be self-defense, third-party culpability, you have to offer some level of proof that it exists. I can't just say, you know what, my client, it was self-defense. The judge is going to say, okay, show me the facts that point that out. And that's what the prosecution is asking the judge to kind of put the defense through the ringer to some degree. The issues I have with that, though, is it sounds to some degree that the defense Defense has just enough to say, hey, I can make an offer of proof and I have a good faith basis that this must have happened, this being that the injuries are not consistent with being hit by a car, and therefore I should be able to go down the rabbit hole of this officer seems a little shady, this officer seems a little fishy, based on what I've found. I think they've reached that level, but the prosecution wants them to go even further and kind of name names, and, and that to me sounds like burden shifting. I think the defense has a strong argument here. Yeah, I think you're right. You say, well, look, we don't have to prove the prosecution's case here just, just to defend our client. So, uh, uh, Catherine, what, what do you think about uh, you know all of this information just pouring out into the community uh, before the trial? And be, by the way, it's a jury selection begins on Tuesday. What, what do you think about where we are in this pre-trial process? Well, it becomes dangerous in terms of the community is now learning more about the backstory of the trial. Usually, this type of facts don't get released around this preliminary hearing, but the judge is asking the prosecutors and the defense attorneys to, okay, educate me, tell me more. And so, as they are telling the judge more, we are learning more as well. So, and the defense attorney said there that the community knows uh, Brian Albert, the officer that is uh, being suspected of actually killing the victim, John O'Keefe here. So he is well known and well connected according to the defense. So we know that some of the jurors might be tainted in that regard. Yeah, it's gonna be tricky for jury selection. Okay, so we're talking about Brian Albert, another Albert. The question is, is either one Uncle Albert? 
And have they done more than a bloody thing all day? So let's listen now to the prosecution. This is their response to the third party culprit evidence argument. First, uh, again, what, what the case law requires is evidence and not just mere speculation or saying that you have evidence is not actually evidence. Um, I, I do find it somewhat interesting that Mr. Yannetti uh, wrote apparently four and a half pages of notes but didn't have time to write a motion uh, to admit uh, the evidence uh, that he claims that he has. Um, he references in regard to uh, third party culprit uh, Dr. Sheridan, uh, who indicated that the injuries are consistent with the fight. And he's the same doctor who indicated that the injuries on uh, Mr. O'Keefe's arm were consistent with the dog bite, which was then refuted by the DNA findings from UC Davis, as well as the fact that the injuries are only on one side of the arm. And last time I checked, uh, dogs have teeth uh, on the top and the bottom, and there's no injuries to the bottom of Mr. O'Keefe's arm. Uh, furthermore, <clears throat> the counsel references the federal grand jury materials in which uh, I would say uh, as has been done numerous times previously is, is severely mischaracterized as to what they actually contain. Uh, so what, uh, the, and it's not a crash reconstructionist as it's been alleged here before, it's a biomechanical engineer. Uh, and essentially what they did was take painstaking lengths uh, to go to, uh, to determine that uh, the defendant's vehicle did not strike uh, Mr. O'Keefe in the back of the head, which is simply something that no one has ever said, intimated, at any point ever. Okay, familiar with the other dude did it defense, but not so much the other dog did it. Uh, Catherine, let me ask you if this this uh, overlying, you know, I've been framed defense, uh, you think it's going to play out in, in this case? Is it, does it, do we know enough about it yet? I can't tell. We'll see what the judge will rule, obviously, but this third party evidence in this trial is actually part of the evidence code. That's why the defense is trying to push for this, because they, the conspiracy theory here that the defense attorney was talking about was that he did not know about Brian Albert and his nephew until he received a tip anonymously that the victim, John O'Keefe, died because of a fight and was left in the snow to die. But here, uh, the conspiracy seems to be that Karen Reed is being framed. And so that's why the third party evidence is crucial for the defense to say, I'm being framed, the defendant is being framed for this murder, and the police are all colluding to cover that up. Yeah, and I can't wait to see why, if that happened, why? What, what, what's the motive? So, Brian, uh, on a kind of a throwback to the O.J. Simpson death uh, yesterday, you know, we learned through that trial, maybe you can't trust the police all the time. How do you think that, you know, carrying forward now 30 years, it layers any trial where there's a question about law enforcement? I, I mean, it, the O.J. trial, the, the Rodney King beating, the, ever since we started getting uh, cameras in everyone's hands, you can see how police operate, the good, the bad, and everything in between. It allows defense attorneys to kind of pierce through this idea that just because individuals have badges on, they're perfect individuals. You have, I say this to jurors, you have good attorneys, you have bad attorneys. You have bad hosts, and then you have amazing hosts like Michael Bryant. It's not the profession, it's the person. And the ability to say that a cop could be bad and people understand that or are willing to listen is massive. And if you can create a conspiracy theory that has some legs to it, it's really great. And I, I'd even say this, prosecutors are very close to police officers because of the nature of their job. So if you're saying that law enforcement is covering things up, you can make the easy transition as a defense attorney and say, well, how much are the prosecutors in on it? Because prosecutors are very hesitant to throw officers under the bus. Uh, so if they're protecting the officers, what do the prosecutors know? And any day you can make the prosecutors the bad guys in the courtroom, it's a great thing for defense attorneys. Yeah, you know, uh, guilt by association in a weird, twisted kind of way there. So, uh, hey, and thanks for the shout out about the hosting there. I, I may have to remove you from the, uh, my uh, restraining order that I had taken out. Okay, so uh, we're, we're going to take a quick break here. Uh, YSL are back. They're back at it, believe it or not. We're going to rejoin that matter out of Fulton County. Let me come right back.